assembled this morning two experts that I think you will be incredibly moved not only by their research, but by their personal stories and by the devotion and commitment. So I wanna start by welcoming you, Naomi, and you, Shana. I'm so delighted you're here. Thank, Thank you here. so much for having us. So let me start with Naomi and tell you a little bit about who she is. Naomi is the Chancellor Jackman Professor of Arts in the Department for Study of Religion and the Center of Diaspora and Transnational Studies at the University of Toronto. Basically, that's a lot of titles. What you really need to know is that she's an insider who actually left. She's gonna talk about her story. She's published four books. Her most recent work on the Base Yaakov Project, I think is a powerful messaging about women and holding history and also moving forward. She has also won a National Book Award in Women's Studies. She's presently working on the study of Freud in Hebrew and a Yiddish translation. Naomi, I am in awe of not only your journey, but of your work, and I'm so delighted that you're here. Shana Hammerman is the Associate Director of the Talby Center for Jewish Studies at Stanford University. She's the author, her first book, which was also her dissertation, Silver Screen, Hasidic Jews, The Story of an Image, you're gonna hear all about her studies. I am blown away by her research and what it tells us about who we are and what it tells us about our Judaism and our own ambivalence and curiosity and defensiveness. She is also published widely on Jews and race, gender and popular culture. Prior to her role as associate director, Hammerman taught Jewish studies courses at universities across the Bay Area. She holds a PhD in Jewish history and culture from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. And when I asked her what she's working on now, she, like all of us, is working on parenting through the pandemic and holding it all together. So I'm delighted to have you as well, Shana, to start. I just want to disclose one other thing, and that is the special relationship between the two of you. When I reached out to Naomi, she said, before you make another move, you've got to call Shana. And when I reached out to Shana and said, Naomi asked me to call her, she goes, do you know what an influence she's had in my life. And then I said, we don't typically have two people at once and you guys are, no, no, we have to be together. And then Shana, I read in your acknowledgements to your book, the way you talked about Naomi as your muse, your favorite writer, the person you channel when you write. I think to have someone that really has your back and really is a person that is in your universe that you truly can rely on is something very special. So I'm not only delighted to have you as individuals, but I'm delighted to have the both of you. So I want to start with you, Shana, to set us up, because this is a conversation that is layered and controversial and a little bit confusing. So before we even get into why you write about the Haredim and how they're portrayed in the media, can you just define some terms for us? Tell us what is Hasidism, ultra-Orthodoxy, Haredim, so we're all on a level playing field. Sure. Thank you so much, and thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, the very short answer is that Hasidic Judaism comes out of 18th century Eastern Europe and it emerges as a pietistic movement that was uh, responding to at least two forces. One were the somewhat exclusionary rabbinic legal structures that already existed. And the other was um, a kind of uh, gradually secularizing, for lack of a better term, um, Jewish world uh, in Eastern Europe where we saw um, artists and philosophers and writers um, rebelling against the traditional Jewish family and, uh, and, and those same legal structures. So it positioned itself uh, against those two forces um, and eventually became um, extremely diverse um, with multiple different sectarian movements and dynasties springing from this sort of initial uh, movement. Um, what people don't know is that it was a rebellion, right? right it was right. a rebellion against Judaism, which people forget. I just want to clarify that. Right. And that one black hat is not all black hats. Right. right. So when we use the term Haredi, which is the term that um, you would hear most likely in Israel to describe all um, ultra-religious or, or ultra-Orthodox Jews, um, that encapsulates both Hasidic Jews and these uh, rabbinic Jews who um, sometimes are called yeshivish, uh, who are not Hasidic, but who are nevertheless uh, ultra-religious. Um, so to the uninitiated, they all look the same. Right, the, the men and women are going to be dressed in a recognizably religious Jewish way, um, but to the, the insiders, 
the sectarian differences reveal themselves. I usually explain it to my students like gang signs, the way that socks are worn, whether the payas are in front of the ears or behind, if your beard is trimmed, the location of your hat on your head, um, the kind of head covering a woman wears. So these are gonna be um, sort of indecipherable to an outsider, but to an insider, uh, really important distinctions. Um, the term ultra-Orthodox is usually met with some resistance because it can be seen as kind of offensive or has been used uh, in ways that are offensive to Orthodox Jews. Um, but we're trying to capture, uh, a, well, in my work, I'm trying to capture an imagery. And the best word that I could use to capture that imagery was Hasidic, even though the Jews that I'm talking about are not always specifically designed to be Hasidic. Very interesting. So. We're going to talk to you, Naomi, in a second about being an insider, but Shana, tell us about what you've learned. I mean, we're obsessed. We're obsessed with all these, and no one would know that there's differentiation between the sex when we watch mainstream media, whether we're watching Stichel or Mrs. Maisel or Unorthodox. Tell us what brought you to this work and sort of your lead findings. Um, I would say on a personal level, this emerged from my own ambivalence about being Jewish, specifically when I lived in France, um, where there's not as many, there's not as much diversity in Jewish religious life. Um, and what I noticed was that there's a constant deference toward Orthodox Jews. And I was wondering where that came from. And when I went to my studies at the Graduate Theological Union and really dove into this diversity of Jewish history, religious practice, um, I wondered why there was an idea of what a true Jew really was. Um, and it became- The real the, Jews. The real like Jews. Like the real Jews are the ones that are, look like 18th century Polish, Right, and everybody else is sort of the fake Jews. Right, well, and, what, and what occurred to me very quickly was that the way that I was initiated into those images was through screens. So it was movies and television that were teaching me um, what a Jew looked like through this imagery. Um, and I wanted to ask that question. And even though at the time my, in my master's degree, I was studying ancient Jews, I thought I was going to be an archaeologist. I went into Nomi's office and I, was, and I said to her, why does everybody think Orthodox Jews are the authentic Jews? Mm -hmm. There are relatively few of them. Uh, and I was trying to kind of unpack this deferential stance and also this kind of resentment, nostalgia. I wanted to understand it. And just from that initial conversation now, my, all of my scholarship kind of took a new path. So I want to touch one more thing about that before we turn to you, Naomi, which is there seems to be a lot of conflicted feelings about this Haredim, right? As non-Haredim, whether it's defensiveness, whether it's judgment, whether, you know, once I heard someone say like, at least, you know, my kid became, thank God he's not a heroin addict. He only became a religious Jew. And it was like, are you kidding me? Right? So I think there's this very mixed layered sense of ambivalence, respect, deference. Can you talk about why you think we portray that imagery on the screen and what it's saying about our own feelings about it? What I quickly discovered is that there's a very big distinction in how um, specifically non-Orthodox Jews feel about images of Hasidic Jews versus how they feel about real life Hasidic Jews. So, um, the imagery is something that is, for the most part, created by these, um, again, for lack of a better term, secular Jews or non-Orthodox Jews. Um, and so in that way, when Jews are portraying Hasidic Jews on screen, there's some kind of ownership that they take over these images. This is, th these images belong to us. So um, if you want to show the image of the co um, that comes from the cover of my book, um, is taken from this scene that's my Zoom background too, which is the Easter dinner table scene in the 1977 movie, Annie Hall, written and directed by Woody Allen and starring Woody Allen. And here we see, this is Woody Allen imagining his character as he imagines his character is being seen, or perhaps as he sees himself um, at that table surrounded by um, non-Jews, by Annie's family. I'm bracketing all of the problematic things about Woody Allen right now um, to talk about how this image is so powerful and so appealing and attractive that American Apparel, this is from 2007, decided to use it on its billboard. 
So this is American clothing brand. Woody Allen is not wearing anything by American Apparel in this image. Uh, the Yiddish up there says Der Heluka Rebbe, which is, means the Holy Rebbe, which is a, a Chabad saying about uh, their uh, rabbi, rabbi. Um But what's important, and it's on Allen Street in New York, what's important is that there's a kind of understood or um, unspoken fascination and obsession with this type of image. And what's really important about it, and this is the claim that I make in my book, is this shared understanding that this is not an actual Hasidic Jew that we're looking at, but this is Woody Allen dressed as a Hasidic Jew. So we can love that image, but if um, when we're looking at actual Hasidic Jews, um, there's more sort of negative feeling. So this is about owning the ability to dress for Jews to disguise themselves or dress up Hasidic. Who do you think American Apparel was targeting in that ad? Was it, is, it Haredi? So it is very, I think it, it was hipsters. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely not the ultra-Orthodox. I don't think they're shopping at American right. Apparel. Um, yeah, I, they, they're, they're targeting, um, yeah, it is, it, the, the, the motives behind it are very clear, are, are very unclear and um, this billboard was only up for two weeks because they didn't have Woody Allen's permission to use the image and so he sued them. Uh, for $10 million. They settled out of court for $5 million, which is one of my favorite stories. It's, it's very unclear what, what Dove Charney, who was the CEO of American Apparel at the time, said was that he was trying, he felt that um, he was the victim of anti-Semitism and of false accusations about his own sexual exploits. Uh, he was accused of being with underage models. Um, and so he felt, I guess, like the character Alvy Singer in this moment, somehow exposed um, or being seen as something he's not, it's, it's super unclear. His motives are unclear um, in that moment. And while the image itself is so clear and so powerful and reads so instantly as Jewish, um, what we see when we really try to dive in and understand what the imagery really means is just a ton of ambivalent messages. And it's very hard to know where to land um, and how to really understand what we're looking at and why, it, why it's there. Oh my, we're going to talk more about that, but I want to turn to you, Naomi, for a second, and then I'm going to talk to the both of you. I don't want to leave you out. Naomi, you not only are a scholar, but you were an insider. You went OTD, and I'm going to have you talk about that. Just, and you've critiqued publicly how the media portrays uh, these images and the ultra-Orthodox community. First, tell me a little bit about you, where you came from and where you are now, and Please define OTD because it's definitely an insider's term. Right. Um, OTD means off the derech, and it refers to <clears throat> it refers to it actually began as a pejorative in the 1990s. Not exactly a pejorative, but the way the Haredi, the firm world, the Orthodox world, they don't use the word ultra Orthodox. Ultra Orthodox sounds like way too Orthodox. Um, right for them. It. Like that would be too orthodox for them, right? We see it as ultra orthodox, but if we use that term, if they use that term, that would be for someone else. Exactly. Like the, the joke was always the people who are more orthodox are insane fanatics and the people who are less orthodox are Guyan, wherever you are on the spectrum. So there's a real sense of those other people are way too orthodox and we're just exactly right. No matter so, where you're standing. Right. Right? <laughs> right. If you're standing in the ultra orthodox from community, there's those crazy people that are ultra orthodox and then there's secular people. Right. What's really funny is that in the off the derech world, the world of people who left and the word off the derech was used first by the insiders, if you want to call them that, to talk about their at risk young people. That was another term that was used who are going off the correct way. Derech right. Derech means path. I just want to um, clarify that. That was then adopted the way queer was adopted and became a kind of positive term of identification by exiters as, which is another term people use or ex-Orthodox Jews. But in the ex-Orthodox world, there's another kind of weird competition for just how Orthodox you grew up. Huh. So, oh, you know, you call yourself, you, grew, you think you grew up Orthodox, ah, you're, that was nothing. Listen to my story. There's a weird competition of, in that world for just how orthodox people grew up, where the more orthodox you were, sort of the more OTD points you get. Right, well, the more orthodox you were 
and the further you went off the path, meaning left it, you get more points depending on if you came from Satmar, like one particular branch or another branch. So wait, tell us where you're from and what happened, just because it's such a powerful story. Which is why people sometimes exaggerate their stories for effect, and also because of the reasons that Shana kind of alluded to, which is that those are the most visible Jews. Those are the ones that we, that are kind of touchstones, especially men over women, right? So the, the, the markers of orthodoxy are so much more visible among men. So you must have heard of Abby Stein, who's one of the best known OTD, who's a, a, a trans woman who went not only from being orthodox to being secular, but from being a man to being a woman, or being assigned male at birth to now being her true self. And on the OTD websites where we hang out on Facebook, we often have a before and after uh, kind of exhibit where you post a picture of yourself orthodox and then not. And people love to look for real extremes. And then when Abby Stein posts her before and after pictures, it's always like, okay, you win. Wait, I just have to say one thing. You like glossed over that, like as if it was nothing, but there are Facebook sites for OTDs to talk about where they came from and where they're going. I mean, that just in itself is mind blowing. So wait, please stop. I don't want to, I want to interrupt you. Tell me where you came from, where you grew up and where you are now. Okay. I, I grew up in Borough Park, which is wait. one of the, let's say the three big ultra Orthodox neighborhoods in Brooklyn. There's Williamsburg, which is in unorthodox. And then there's Borough Park, which we thought of ourselves as very modern compared to the Williamsburg people. And then there's Crown Heights, which is dominated by Chabad. Though the whole Orthodox world was moving to the right. So now Borough Park is the way Williamsburg used to be. But maybe this is in, too inside the weeds. I left when I was 18. I ran away from home as a teenager. My joke is always that the age of legal runaways should be raised to 36 for Orthodox Jews because um, of how few skills we had or whatever. And I, I really left. Um, I didn't have contact with my family for a couple of years. And, um, and I just, I went to college. I got a degree and, and became a professor. I, as I call it, I monetized my unhappy childhood and now making a, a living, if you call it a living, as a Jewish studies professor. Um, I teach at the University of Toronto and I live there part of the year, but I happen to be in Berkeley right now. So you grew up in a ultra-Orthodox home. Yes. And would you share the story about what your parents thought, what was wrong with you because you were questioning some of these things? What was your life like? Yeah, so I was, um, uh, I kind of was a little budding atheist by the time I was, I don't know, 11, 12. Um, and not only did I not believe what I was being told, I couldn't understand how other people believed it. And one of the things about being a heretic is that it's not actually a kind of allowable category for girls. Um, the way the girls went bad in Bar Park was by hanging out at the pizza store with boys. And I really wanted to be a heretic. I didn't want to be, as I say, you know, a whore or a bum. That was the term in Borough Park, was a bum, a bummy girl. Um, but in any case, I was just, my parents were, I was getting in trouble. I was unhappy. They sent me to the, to a, a, a from therapist, an Orthodox therapist. And from therapist is, some of your viewers were probably there on Monday. They're, this is part of what they deal with, is at-risk youth. And, right. and I, let's be clear, um, at-risk in secular culture is at-risk for drugs and alcohol. At-risk yes. at in uh, a Haredi culture is at-risk for becoming an Epicurus, right? Exactly. Or something, though sometimes it's, it's drugs and alcohol too, or as I said, for girls, it's often becoming bummy or slutty. Um, like so I was being attracted, of, being sexually involved with boys. Right. right. Which means in the Orthodox w world can just mean talking to them um, because these worlds are totally sexually segregated, but there's these little pockets where you can kind of sneak away to the margins of the community and so I was doing all that. I was in trouble at school and whatever. I was sent to a therapist. Um, it's typical in the Orthodox world that 
if you're quote unquote at risk, you um, are seen as there must be something psychologically wrong with you. Hmm. Um, and these therapists will talk about, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the stereotype is that maybe you've been abused or people aren't nice to you. Sometimes people who are from, you know, that I grew up with will say, we're so sorry, we must have done something bad to you. And I said, no, 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 you're fine. Nothing, no, no complaints. Um, but in any case, my parents sent me to a, a from therapist who was really very orthodox, a man with a beard, a totally from guy. He wasn't the first therapist I saw. It was one after another when I was growing up. And to figure um, out what was wrong. To figure out what was wrong with me. I remember the first session was family therapy. My brother sat there and um, the therapist said, why are you here? And, you know, my parents said, well, we're worried about Nomi. And my brother said, we're here because Nomi's a bum. There, in any case, they said that we went around and around. And, and, and the third session, we walk in and the therapist says to us, um, this is going to be the last session and, and I'm not going to charge you for it. And we were all really surprised why we, I was starting to like him. And he said, you know, I think that what's really going on here is that you want Nomi to be from all of you and Nomi doesn't want to be from that's not really a psychological issue that's more of a theological issue and I, this is beyond my expertise that's what he said and this this was a, I'm persuaded the moment and coming from an orthodox man when I was set free when the whole story that oh there's something wrong with me and i'm a little crazy i'm a little weird or maybe something terrible has happened to me was suddenly clarified that i was a human being who had thoughts and attitudes about the world into which i was in which i was raised and that i was allowed to have an attitude about it or a perspective on it that didn't mark me as a as as a crazy person and that's it took me a few years to actually get away, but that was what get, that was my permission slip. And I don't remember this man's name, but if you're out there, thank you, thank you, thank you. First of all, I have tears hearing the story, and even though I knew it and I've read it, for someone to in that world to confirm your reality and to quote set you free, I think all of us have a need to have our reality confirmed wherever we are. You talk about being set free. Was it a prison? It was in some sense a prison. I mean, there was no easy way to leave. I mean, I had no money. I had, my parents didn't have any money. I had no skills. At, when I, I wanted to go away to college, I begged my parents to let me go away to college, but there wasn't money for that. And they just, they didn't. I ended up going to Brooklyn College Night School. And that was a kind of freedom because at least it was a secular school. Now my nieces and nephews and you know their kids they all go to Orthodox colleges. They don't even get a little taste of the outside world. I literally, I, I don't think I had a conversation with anyone who wasn't Orthodox until I was, until I left, basically. There was just no, there was no exit sign. Um, there was no way out. There was no, um, you know, you could get some degree of freedom by marrying and then you're a grown up, but then you immediately have children for the most part. So when was that moment gonna come um, and I actually, when I left the world, I, that world, I was engaged to be married. And I realized it was my last possible moment. And if I didn't leave now, I'd, you know, be married, I'd be pregnant, I'd have kids. I'd be in the position of the double lifers that Ayala talks about, who don't believe in or forced into an Orthodox world. And then I thought, I so don't want to be Orthodox. I'm not, what am I afraid of? And I just left. I'm speechless because I think we all ask that question. What am I so afraid of? And it takes a certain, a lot of us answer, I'm so afraid and I am paralyzed. But to say, what am I so afraid of? And to take that action, people say to you, it's courageous. And when I said that in a conversation earlier, you're like, ugh, not courageous. I don't even like that phrasing. Tell me why. It's funny, I had, you know, I had a therapist say that to me. What a courageous person you are. You managed to do it. Um, the thing that I now see about the story of me leaving and that I felt even when it was happening was that it, that story is totally told from the perspective of American liberalism. I now understand having heard Ayala talk about it, 
that all the value is on the individual and free choice and autonomy and none of the value is on the people left behind and the hearts you broke. Um, none of that story gets to be told. That's not the story we're interested in. And I actually think that at some of the ambivalence that Shana's talking about, right, that the ambivalence that we feel toward this Orthodox past, which in some sense is the past of all secular Jews, um, that some of that is because we understand that it's not a simple story, the break with that tradition. And, and the fact that the other story that's so popular, along with unorthodox and, and all these ex-Orthodox memoirs, is, is Fiddler on the Roof. And what's so unique about Fiddler on the Roof is it tells the story of people who leave from the perspective of their father, right? The father of those daughters. And to see that story told from the other perspective, imagine Romeo and Juliet told from the perspective of Mr. Montague and Mr. Capulet, right? We're, our whole culture is designed to say, there's only one story that counts. And it's the story of the 18 year old sexy motorcyclist, right? I got a motorcycle. Um, the story of the people that got left behind and, what, and who they are. That's not of any interest. They're only there as their only interest is as an obstacle to the true story, which is the story that, of course, confirms the rightness of the American ideology of free choice and et cetera, all that. It's not, it, it, it doesn't hear the, 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 the pain of the parents or the pull of community or the, 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 you know, the other half, what I think of as the other half that always goes missing. Um, that, that, that somehow it, it is not allowed its full say. And that's something that I've just felt more and more as I've gotten older. And it's one reason that, you know, I've had, fr I have a friend who's a literary um, agent uh, and he's always saying, no me, you should write your memoir, you know, or he actually calls me up with these crazy ideas. I know a graphic novel about Hasidic zombies. We're gonna get rich off of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something of a lie in, in, in the OTD narrative. That's what I was trying to get at in my review of Unorthodox. Right. Your review on Unorthodox really criticizes um, not just the portrayal, but this linear view of one narrative, like because it confirms the American narrative. And I think what you're saying is like, this is a very layered and nuanced discussion. And it's a family that breaks apart and there's all different narratives coming from all those who experience it. And maybe it's time we start presenting, as you say, Naomi, all the other narratives and Shana also presenting what this is saying about us as a people, why we only have to present this one linear way and the freedom story. And it looks like the real Jews are like this. So there's lots of things to say. Shana, you want you said what the title meant in the Yiddish in the ad. Would you just say that again? Um, it's uh, Der Helika Rebbe, the Holy Rebbe, which is about Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the the uh, she the most recent Rebbe of the Chabad movement of Hasidic Jews. It's this is a, a term used to refer to him. Naomi, that I want to turn to you at. Um, what what sect were you a part of? There's just some factual details we need to get out. <laughs> Well, that's just a, a, a sign of how much more complicated the Orthodox world is than you might think. <clears throat> I, my father grew up as a Shatner Chassid. Um, his Rebbe survived the war, but set up shop in Tel Aviv, not exactly a hotbed of Hasidic fervor. Um, and so my father was a, a Chassid without portfolio, I guess you could say. Um, he was also a writer and a journalist. Yes, there are writers and journalists in that world. So he, he in some ways stood at a kind of sociological distance from the world. And we, we did this thing called shul hop, which is, you know, my father would go from shul to shul to shul. My father was actually friends with various Hasidic Rebbe's as opposed to followers of them. So I, I grew up, uh, and my brother went to uh, the Stolen or Yeshiva, if that means anything to you. So we were in some way already inside, outside the community. <clears throat> insiders, when you said insiders, I felt like, I never felt like an insider. For a hundred different reasons, it wasn't, people have this image of, 
you know, I went to a school, Beis Yaakov had 1,500 girls in it. It wasn't exactly Heimish, you know, homey, little shtetl. I don't know what people are imagining. They were, you know, these were over full classes with, you know, it was, it was a, a huge institution of study for girls. Um, so, so my father didn't fit into any category. My mother came from a non-Hasidic home, but her sisters all became Hasidic. There's a lot more fluidity in that community uh, than you might think. And as, I love that Shana said what she said. There, the Hasidim that have the internet, which they're not off, without filters, that you're not supposed to have, they knew perfectly well what coronavirus was. Others didn't. They relied on their leaders. And the leaders failed for various reasons. But if you get anything out of this conversation, understanding that it's not a sea of black, first of all, it's not all men, but it's not a sea of black, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a fluid world, and the word sect makes me want to laugh. Sorry, no offense to whoever asked that question. Um, it's so foreign to how people see themselves. But yeah, sorry, I, I don't mean to no, offend I so. the questioners. I think it's so stunning because there's so much I could just unpack with every sentence that you're saying. When you went to Beis Yaakov, you're now doing a project called the Beis Yaakov Project. Um, you. Tell us, you had no secular education when you were young. No, I, you know, that again is, is yeah, this is my baby. Thank you for showing a picture of my baby. Um, there's about five or six of us, most of us um, OTD Beis Yaakov girls. Beis Yaakov is the uh, Orthodox... That was such an insider group. phrase. OTD Beis Yaakov girls. Off the Derek girls that went to Beis Yaakov, which was the girls students studies. We got to like, you know, there's the so The largest Orthodox girls school system in the world, which has hundreds of schools in about 13 countries. And uh, there are some still Orthodox uh, women um, affiliated with the Beis Yaakov project. And all of us together are devoted to the history of the school that we went to. And absolutely, I got a secular education um, in Beis Yaakov. We had a religious Jewish education and in the morning. And then we had a, a you know, secular, I guess you could call it education. It's different for girls and for, girl, for boys. The boys, my brother got a much less full secular education than I did. And, um, we learned literature. I read Silas Marner. We did music and art um, in Beis Yaakov. So, um, yeah, I got a secular education. I don't know if it was a fabulous one, um, but I have a PhD, so. Yeah, so clearly you, it didn't keep you back. <laughs> but I would say that the role of women is not portrayed in the media in these very from, and I think, as you said, 50% are women, and yet we hate keep them hidden. And when we do talk about them, we talk about them with regard to this forbidden sex. And what does that mean? So would you guys speak to the role of women for a few moments? Yeah, so in, in the representational world, it is much more challenging to represent um, what a religious Jewish woman looks like than a religious Jewish man. We can point to just that imagery from that American Apparel poster, the beard, the hat, the payas, boom, it's clear, it takes two seconds, we know exactly what that is. Um, even if we don't know all of these sort of more nuanced details, we know Jew. Now, if we took a, a religious Jewish woman or a Hasidic Jewish woman and put her up on that, uh, it would take a lot more work for, or a lot more knowledge for us to say, okay, I, I see what this is portraying. Um, part of this has to do with um, what Sneas or modest clothing uh, looks like uh, for a woman versus a man. For a woman, it involves covering her hair and covering most of her body. And so that really, lots of women cover their bodies, lots of women wear wigs, um, lots of women cover their hairs from non-Jewish um, religious or cultural practices. So it's just, um, it's more difficult and more nuanced. And part of what I argue in my book is that because of that nuance, there's actually more freedom to portray women in more interesting ways. Um, but one of the outcomes, and I initially started talking about um, how we wanna see Woody Allen beneath the Hasidic costume. When, when we expose the Jew beneath the secular 
person, like in this a scene in my background here, when um, Woody Allen's character Alvi becomes Hasidic and he's exposed that way, he puts on something. He puts on a beard, he puts on a hat, he puts on payas, he puts on a black uh, suit or caftan. But we, when we want to um, expose a Jewish woman, we have to take something off, right? Take off the wig. And what's underneath the wig is just more hair, right? It, it, it looks the same. Um, so there's the, the idea that it's, that there's a clear costume for uh, representing Jewish womanhood, there's not. Um, what the outcome for women viewers is even further alienation, right? On the one hand, oh, the, I'm not Orthodox, so I can't fit into this mold of what a true Jew looks like. And then beyond that, I'm not a man, so, um, what's available to me if I want to make myself visibly Jewish. And Nomi has talked about this a lot in her own um, teaching and, and, and writing, uh, the difficulty of trying to put on that costume when she was at the GTU, when there were people in monks clothes and their priestly garb and um, various different sort of religious uh, vestments. And how could she show up in that moment as a, a, a Jewish leader if she would want to? I think what you've touched upon is like, it's far more layered and nuanced and there's many other stories to tell. And the fact that we have only told this one sort of story is saying a lot about us, right? And that it's about what we want to project and are about our own conflict. And it's interesting, there's a lot of defensiveness. My daughter doesn't do this, my, you know, there's some, it raises our, our guard, like we're frightened, like, what does this say? And I think it's important today to really think about what does it raise for you about your own identity and what does it raise for your own Jewishness? I can't thank you guys enough. The amount of invites, people want you back. So I hope that you'll come back again and again. And we just want to tell you, stay well. We are in this together. See each other's humanity. See each other's Judaism. Thank you so much. <laughs>